Hey friends, this is your host, film critic and comedian Nate Wyckoff, and I just want to remind you to like and subscribe and go ahead and recommend this podcast slash YouTube series to anyone you think might enjoy it or people that you just don't like and you want to see them suffer through something you think they won't enjoy. Also, go to cultandclassicfilms.com and make sure you subscribe to get cult exclusive movies delivered in special editions to your door every month for dirt cheap. That's right. Our Patreon has awesome stuff you can get every month, as well as perks and discounts at our online store. And remember, you need to do this. Otherwise, our good friend, Sar- there you go. Sergeant Kabuki Man will be after you. And just a heads up, most people that go against him end up dead in weird ways. So make sure not to do that. Here's your show and enjoy. Welcome to Cult and Classic. <laughs> All right, friends and fiends of the pod, welcome to another episode of Cult and Classic. As always, I'm your host, Nate Wyckoff, comedian and horrornews.net staff writer. I want to uh, take this moment before I get to anyone else, because it's all about Cult and Classic Podcast, uh, to suggest you go check out our Patreon, brand new at patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. Uh, we want you to be able to support us, the podcast you love. And if you don't love us, we want you to be able to give us money so we can improve and become the podcast that you love. What is even better about this is it can cost you as low as a dollar a month and you get access to videos of all of our recorded sessions. So you can see our beautiful shining faces, including those of many of our in- famous interviews of which we have awesome, awesome lineups coming up for you. Also, uh, you can be a Patreon member and get autographed art trading cards, uh, which are cult and classic exclusives and exclusive zines through our membership tiers. So check it out, patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. Also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and everywhere that you are. Okay, so this episode I'm super excited about, a very special first uh, edition of our Love Hate podcast special. So that is a film that we love and a film that we hate, and we will tell you exactly why you should love and hate them yourselves. With us today, we have the full crew. We have Tad Mastriani. How you doing, Tad? hey And Tad uh, just recently bought a house and has another baby on the way, which would be number two. So he's doing nothing with his life. I don't know why. It's, it's exactly I why I have been mysteriously absent. Yeah, I don't know why you're not here every week. Uh, coming up as well, we have Greg Johnson. How you doing, Greg? Uh, I've actually decided I don't want to be on the podcast anymore, so I'm going to bounce. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, up next, we have the wonderful Amanda Longley. How are you doing, Mandy? I'm good today. Good. Today, as opposed to other days? Today. (laughs) You got to pick the movies you talk about, so you're good today. Yeah, yes, exactly. (laughs) Very happy. Couldn't be happier today. And I think that's everyone. I'm just kidding. We still have our... (laughs) Our old standby, Jeff Tucker. How you doing, Jeff? Good. <laughs> that's it. All right. That's all, I, that's, all I have, that's all I can afford today from Jeff. Well, you gave me a shitty intro, so I'm going to give you a shitty, <laughs> shitty follow-up. Uh, one we, word today. we love everyone. And uh, remember, you can join the conversation by emailing us at cultandclassicpodcast at gmail.com. And I promise that is the last advertisement for a while. Today, we are going to talk about movies that we adore, that we think everyone should watch, and movies that we despise. And we will tell you exactly why they're the bane of our existence. First, I'm going to go to Greg. Greg, what movie do you love? Um, I, I cheated a little bit, and I uh, picked a two uh, two part film called uh, Bahu Bali, um, both of which are on Netflix right now. So, Bahu Bali the beginning and Bahu Bali the conclusion. Nice. Well, let me let me play a little clip here from the trailer for Bahu Bali the beginning, so people can get kind of a vibe. And of course, it is uh, in Tengali, I think. Uh, it um, is- yeah, it's in. Um, <sighs> I, I wrote it down: uh, Telugu and Tamil. I'll, Tamil. I'll talk about that after the clip. I literally got uh, everything wrong, but yes. <laughs> so my apologies. Sound like amazing languages, but let's listen to this little clip here. <laughs> Yes, it sounds a little bit like the music you'd hear in maybe a New Age shop or something, but I want to choose that because just from looking at these films, I can tell they are epic and this music starts to set it up as kind of like this grand scale affair. Am I right? 
Yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, it's not. I I think it falls under the like Bollywood umbrella, but I know that it had some subgenre within that. So I apologize for not being as on point with that. But um, going back to the languages, actually, the um, the Telugu and the Tamil. Um, it, apparently, it was filmed in two languages simultaneously, which are both prominent languages of India. And half of the cast spoke one language and half of the cast spoke the other. So you'd have actors and actresses throwing their own native language at each other while the other one was maybe doing a different language. And then they went back, had them re-record their lines in the language they didn't do and then dubbed all that over to have a simultaneous release. That's crazy. And I mean, that sort of reminds me of uh, those of us who've listened all the way since the beginning. We had a mini episode where I talked about uh, uh, Dead or Alive, um, the, the movie based off the video game where they had something like over a dozen foreign languages shot on set and it was a nightmare. So I can imagine that even with two, you definitely had a different experience on set. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would imagine it got a little bit wild at times, and there were other languages as well. Um, weirdly, at least on Netflix, they have a, an English dub over for the beginning, but not for the conclusion. Huh. Um, so I thought that was a little bit odd. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, well, one, it's, it's, this is basically a fantasy epic. I loved it. Um, it is five hours total, um, so definitely get some food if you're going to sit down and try and do it all. Um, it looks yeah. like a martial arts epic too, right? Like there's a lot of choreography. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of fighting, a lot of songs, a lot of dancing, a lot of over the top drama. Um, the songs um, going back to those are, are absolutely um, hilarious, but wonderful at the same time. Um, like, I'm trying to like basically all the songs um, kind of switch between kind of more metaphorical lyrics discussing kind of the themes occurring or being more straightforward about like, Oh, here comes Bahubali. Like he's about to fight this guy and punch him out. He's going to beat this guy. And like, they're just kind of narrating what's happening, but it's all, as you kind of heard from the music, like very whimsical over the top. It's some chanting, some singing. Um, what, what is, so, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, when I, when I watched just the trailers, it was almost like it felt like kind of a mix between like a, a Prince of Persia, Lord of the Rings with like a Hindi vibe, like just this, this really, um, like you said, a fantasy, but really epic. Like there's giant statues and cityscapes and over the top weapons and uh, it, totally, it seemed like the kind of thing that I should have heard of and I have never seen this film. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, pretty... Um, straightforward story overall um, uh, a kid um, kind of vanishes at birth um, is taken away like in the middle of um, like a, a coup and slowly realizes who he is which is the crown prince of this of the city um, so it, the first half is really the um, the kid's story, him growing up, him learning who he is. And then the second half is his father's story and what happened. And then kind of the, the big clash at the end where he takes on his like usurper uncle. Lord of, so, so it's basically the Lion King. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's the Bollywood Lion King. <laughs> um, which, which was the, which, yeah, which was the, the Disney Hamlet. Okay, I get you. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome okay so i'm sold on this movie series I, i'm like i literally was pulling the clip this morning like oh okay i'm gonna watch this um that brings us to the question what is your favorite moment out of this that duo um there, it's a it's again a little cheating it's two moments because in the beginning um you see this scene with the um the the usurped queen or at least the usurped princess and um she is kind of pacing around she's a prisoner and this guy comes to her and is like oh like why are you like pacing around and picking up twigs like have you gone mad and she like turns to him all dramatically the music's flaring up and she is like like i am collecting twigs to build a bed of flames and like that is what i will throw the king upon and then <laughs> in the second film near the end um the final battle is around that bed and 
like Bahu, the tentacular Bahubali is like, I'm like, like before you have paced around this building three times, I will have put him upon the bed. And so it just this kind of wonderfully dramatic moment at the beginning where you're like, that's like, that's, that's so intense and so visceral <laughs> and like such a like specific way to say that someone's going to die. And then in the second, it actually comes to pass. Um, that but yeah, it's just a satisfying moment. Satis- and that's the thing. It seems like, especially, I mean, really good reviews. People love this movie, Cross Culture, this, this series. And so I'm excited to see it. And uh, I, I have to say, so we've talked about some maybe Western comparisons, but uh, if someone's favorite, what if, who would you recommend this to uh, if their favorite movie is something? So if their favorite movie is, is this, why would you recommend this film or would you recommend this film? Um, well, I mean, you did mention Lord of the Rings. I'd say, yeah, like if, if you're a fan of that. Um, but I was thinking about like a foreign film. Um, actually, I think if you like Kung Fu Hustle, I think that this would <laughs> With be... the dancing. That, yeah, yeah, we were just talking about that movie today, the, me and my wife. Um, and that definitely, I feel like, dealt with um, its own set of issues, whereas um, Bahubali deals very much with Indian culture. It deals mm-hmm. with um, themes of kind of the caste system, um, stacking hierarchies of duty and kind of like, well, my duties to my country, but I specifically pledged to the king. So if the king is not for the country, then like what, like where does my loyalty actually lie? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's, um, but Kung Fu Hustle, I think. Yeah, I feel like that, this is, this is the, the easy jump. And, and I just, for those listening, it may sound, uh, cause it did to me sort of like, um, Siddhartha in the in the the uh, the the epic, um, as in there's these really sort of poetic um, moments like before you pace around this house three times to, to Western ears it probably almost sounds like a biblical story which it kind of is for you know Indian culture it's it's that sort of vibe and I, I really enjoyed seeing that uh, just in the trailer so I look forward to spotting it. Now we're gonna move on to uh, a film you hate. What is this film? Uh, I picked uh, 2012's uh, ABCs of Death. I was hoping <laughs> at least someone else has seen this. No? Uh, I have seen this film, and I've got oh. a clip for us, so let's listen. And before everyone God. like who hasn't seen this film, it is, uh, it is um, uh, an anthology series. So there's like 26 films, basically, or short, if you can call some of them that, um, that, that deal with letters, that start with letters of the alphabet. And this is a clip from uh, my personal favorite, uh, T is for Toilet. Here we go. I can't understand why he's so afraid of the toilet. Well, for young boys, the most common cause for genital injury is when the toilet seat falls down. He's not going to have that problem if he's going for a poo. Loads of people died on the toilet. Like who? Elvis. He died on the bathroom floor. Yeah, died on the toilet and then fell over. If I were him, I'd be more scared of those screws I put in. It's the wrong size. So, and that is actually a claymation short, uh, which I think sets it fry. But, Greg, what is it about this movie? Uh, first off, why did you watch this movie? Um, I had heard about it from someone or, you know, just kind of browsing like, you know, films you have to see before you die or like cult classic, you know, just various lists. I saw this pop up a couple of times and I'm like, well, okay. Like there's, there's some common ground. Let's, let's give it a whirl. Um, I am glad that you picked tea for toilet though, because that is one of the shorts I actually liked. Um, <laughs> which I feel like that's why I hated this so much is because there's like, there's two or three that are really, really stellar. That being one of them. Um, I think I also put um, uh, like J is for Jedi Geki, um, which is like, it's a, this samurai who's about to like behead someone and the person about to be beheaded, like keeps making silly faces and he can't concentrate to like, chop his head off (laughs) um just just some very fun ideas but god like um around uh f is for fart which is uh about like a woman fixated with another woman's farts and their weird love triangle which involves her like i think going up her asshole and living in her stomach (laughs) um uh d is for dog fight where i'm pretty sure they actually had a fucking dog fight like i I, I was watching that one. I'm like, none of this looks staged. Like this looks like a dog fight. No, yeah. No one, no one knows they're in a movie right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but honestly, I, I don't know. I felt like watching this. I'm like, this is, 
every single example of why you don't let a first year film student do whatever the <laughs> fuck they want. And, and, and by just... the way, I will, I will say this, uh, Greg and I both went to Chapman University for our undergrads. And uh, that was Chapman Film School's like claim to fame when they first opened their big new film school, which is beautiful, the Dodge uh, Film and Media Center. And uh, their thing is we give everyone a, a camera right away. Other people have to work on group films. And I will tell you something, that is uh, often a poor decision. Uh, because you, there is something to be said for uh, letting directors know that maybe they're not the best writers and uh, maybe you need to learn some things because I sat through so many short films uh, that were basically, I'm on my own now. I can talk about sex and have people swear. I, very tiring, very tiring. And I get it. I think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of shorts in there where you're like, this was picked because it was bizarre, not because it's good. Yeah, like, 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 um, do you, do you want to watch a dude try and jack off to a kid? Do you want to watch a cat get stomped out? Like, just, just pick the worst fucking shit you can imagine. And it's all here. It's all here. And it's just, just terrible. And, <laughs> like, and I mean, there's, it's, it's interesting. If you go, it got, I urge people who haven't seen this film to go on IMDb and look up the list of directors because, um, there's some really great directors in there, including Ty West, who's, you know, worked on uh, House of the Devil, um, and the innkeepers, things like that. And then he did Emma's for Miscarriage, which is really not in his normal wheelhouse. So it's like, there's, it's, and there's a sequel as well, ABC's of Death 2. And there are also, if you go to YouTube, a million short films for, uh, for these as well, like T's for Torture, things like that, because they had a competition for people to make uh, short films based on these, and then they picked from them. So interesting experiment. Um, I think you've named some of its worst moments. Uh, what's a better alternative to this movie? Um, well, actually, since you mentioned the short films, um, I got two recommendations. One, if you've never read the anthology, um, I think it's called Machine of Death. Um, go ahead and read that. It's basically, it's um, a prompt was given where a machine, you go and you press it or whatever the writer wants, but the machine gives you one or two words that tell you how you're going to die. And all the stories are just around that, like how, how this world works, where this machine exists. Um, if you're looking for something to watch, um, I wrote down um, Trick or Treat. Um, I'm trying to remember what year that was, but it's, a, it's like a horror anthology revolving around this little like spooky kid in a costume named Sam who kind of ties them all together yeah. and is like a, like a, a Halloween spirit, so to say. Anna Paquin, um, Brian Cox, 2007. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, but yeah, that that's so much more interesting. Um, every single like story in that was was engaging and unique and just kind of fun. And the fact that it all felt tied together versus this, like ultimately, it just felt like they had kind of an idea and wanted to see what people did with it. And like you said, like you get you get some really good ones, and there's some really talented directors, but then you get a lot of um, just absolute trash just yeah like. and and if anyone's interested uh, machine of death is from 2012 uh it, it's edited uh by ryan north uh who is famous for a lot of things including writing the uh adventure time comics which are seriously brilliant they are they are brilliant they're not just like oh extra stories or side stories they're super awesome uh and matthew bernardo and david malky so check that out machine of death 2010 book matthew bernardo ryan north david malky okay uh last last question on this um is there anyone you would recommend abcs of death to um nazis there's a lot of nazi shit in here so i guess <laughs> if you're you're into that there's at least three or four shorts just for you so, so yeah if you've gotten tired of watching apt pupil and downfall like <laughs> 20 dozen times then then go ahead and watch this film all right uh so that is is it for greg's love hate list uh, we're going to move this along in a different direction. Mandy, let's talk about your love. What movie do you love? Okay, so I went about this as picking a movie I hated, and then I picked one that I let, that I loved that paired with it because I have too many love movies, I guess. I love. So um, I picked Ever After with the illustrious Drew Barrymore. All right, Ever uh, After a Cinderella story. Let's listen to a yes. clip from the trailer. I think many people will have seen this film, but I do mm -hmm. think, this was my case too, until my wife brought it up, because it's also one of her favorite movies, is 
it, I feel like it's a film that a lot of people saw when it came out, but haven't maybe rewatched. And I think that it's worth it. So let's, let's listen to this. And it's true, the story. Oh, yes. Now then, what is that phrase you use? Once upon a time. And let's just listen and enjoy that 1998 soundtrack because uh, that is is so very on point uh, for when this movie was just massive. And uh, this movie also just to kind of started, Andy Tennant directed it and he directed a lot of um, the sort of romance comedies that we remember from recent memory like Fool's Gold, Hitch, Sweet Home Alabama. Uh, he's well he's well versed in this genre. Why, uh, first, why did you see this movie uh, when it came out, I assume, Mandy? I probably saw it when it came out in a theater because I was a target audience of a teenage girl who adored Drew Barrymore. So they got me. Um, <laughs> but as you mentioned, I have gone back and watched this several times. I know it's like used to be on TV a lot. Uh, now it's, um, I couldn't really find it on streaming. I thought I had a DVD of it. It disappeared. I don't know. But it's, it's definitely one of those ones I'd love to put on in the background. Um, and yeah, so I guess... I don't know. It's streaming but, on Cinemax right now. If anybody has yeah, the Cinemax, Cinemax channel, it is, it is streaming there. Yeah. All right. So, so, so what's this movie about? I mean, it's called Ever After a Cinderella Story. It's a little self-explanatory, but I think there's a little more to mm -hmm. it. There's a little more. Like, um, I guess you have uh, Drew Barrymore's character named Danielle, and the, the follows the normal storyline of Cinderella, but with a twist is that she's very modern very strong female lead character. Uh, she's a princess who rescues herself. She's not gonna take any sass from this prince who is interested in her. Um, she kind of gets, gets, he gets interested in her because he um, thinks she's someone else or a courtier because she dresses up to rescue one of her servants from being shipped to the Americas. Um, and this takes place in France. Um, so it, it's just like, it's a different take, like uh, a much stronger independent version of Cinderella, but she still gets her prince in the end. And I think it's important to mention that Angelica Houston is uh, essentially the wicked stepmother uh, in this film. And you actually, I mean, she is the wicked stepmother, but you also kind of feel kind of bad for her in the beginning uh, because it opens with her, her marriage and moving in. We hear that little clip from the trailer of, of Drew Barrymore's character as a child being like, oh, it's so great. It's like Christmas, I get a whole new family. And then instantly the father dies, <laughs> like right away. Like the, the mother and the, and the new siblings get to the house and then the father dies. And all of a sudden, yeah. uh, Angelic Houston's character has to sort of make do as a single woman in this time. So you, I, I feel like she's, she's not a nice character. In fact, she's quite awful and you don't like her, but at the same time, it gave her this level of depth that you don't get in a typical, like, you know, like thinking of the, Di the Disney rehash of, of Rapunzel, which people love for some reason, Tangled. Sorry guys, I don't think it's a good movie. Not my hate list, but not a good movie. But we're like, uh, yeah, the mom is just evil, just evil. There's no excuse. And I don't think that this one is that way. No, I didn't feel that way about her either. Um, I mean, she's horrible. Um, but she's also like, she is trying to navigate like a difficult situation. There are some glimpses into the fact that she did actually care about her husband um, that she married. She didn't just marry him for a position or money. Like they, it's very like kind of well-balanced and done where you just see a little bit of that and then you're left um, considering maybe her deeper feelings. Um, but you know, she's, um, also just very ambitious and she wants her um, biological daughters to have it all and she will stop at nothing to get it done and she's angelica houston so normally she would get it uh <laughs> what if you could pick one moment what's your favorite moment from this movie so my absolute favorite moment from this movie is when she saves the prince from the gypsies and it is um based on an old story of a sieged castle where uh, women were allowed to carry whatever, like to take whatever they could carry away from that site um, where there was a battle going to take place. Um, and what they did was they chose to carry their men out in a way to safety. And because, you know, people are, uh, you know, honorable 
uh, reputations and whatnot, they let that happen. Um, but I just thought it was a great uh, turn of the tables um, for them to do that in the story where she could be the hero um, and she saved the prince. Yeah, it really was like a, a, a sort of precursor to that Shrek uh, Matrix moment, right? Uh, where where she where she you know kicks the kicks the butt of the thieves and and, mm -hmm. and Shrek is surprised. Uh, yeah. Just had to work Shrek in there somehow. Yeah, uh, I love so Shrek too. If why uh, would you recommend people watch this movie if you had to uh, argue it in court? Okay, so I would say that um, this is actually also one of the ones I'd recommend can um for my hated movie as like a alternate because i think it does a really good job not only turning the tables on the story um i think that it it delivered what i expected which was the cinderella story with drew barrymore right but um they also mix in leonardo da vinci in there so there's some like historical stuff that's not all lined up with actual history um but it's in there as a nice flavor um it has great costumes it has chocolate, like they introduced chocolate from, was it Spain? And uh, I thought that was nice, but also like, I just really liked that it made Danielle and the Prince feel very modern in this uh, like period piece. So they were like on the edge of like getting the new food and like reading the new books and having the new like liberal ideas and wanting to like push the boundaries of what the current king and queen were doing in the kingdom. So I think that it, um, you know, it challenges sort of the stereotypical period piece um, and it actually gives those main characters a very kind of modern feel. That's interesting. And I, I want to say too, you mentioned Leonardo da Vinci. He is, he does provide some of the comedy relief in this film. And, um, and I think he does a great job. And he's played by Patrick Godfrey, who uh, you, you probably would recognize him. I mean, he's, he's like not, uh, 87 now. So he's been around, he's still alive, still acting. But gamers will probably recognize his voice. Uh, he did voices in Red Dead Redemption 2, Bioshock 2. Um, he plays a lot of the old, the old uh, grumbly gruff voices. So um, he's recognizable uh, both in face and in voice. So, okay, you tried to flip the script. You tried to give this to me as also a hate. I totally uh, respect that. But what film did you choose for your I hate it film? Okay, so wow, again, they got me in the original marketing. So it was maybe their target audience, or they got my friends. Um, and the movie was A Knight's Tale. So I was in college, dating myself a little, because we know when this movie came out. <laughs> 2001. Um, in 2001. Um, and I had a bunch of friends that were into like period reenactment type stuff. It was not exactly my thing, but they're like, come with us. And I'm like, oh, I love like British period films and TV shows and stuff. I was raised on Are You Being Served? Like, it's totally my jam. Um, I'll go with you, that's great. They go in, but I had this total like serious frame of mind. Like, this is gonna be a serious movie about jousting. <laughs> and it opens up with, we will rock you. Yeah, let's, take a, listen. Just... let's take a listen from the trailer. Here. Uh, <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> there you go. And, and this is of course the, the Heath Ledger film from 2001 on Night's Tale. And, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, this, if, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a big horror fan. Uh, of course, the director for Night's Tale is Brian uh, Helgland, who's often thought of as a pretty mainstream director. Uh, he did Night's Tale, A Man on Fire with Denzel Washington, 42. He wrote uh, the award-winning LA Confidential. Um, but he also, he actually started in horror films. He wrote uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, and one of the best 80s horror films, 976 Evil. So uh, remember that when you watch his movies. He cut his teeth on those crazy, crazy 80s horrors. So Night's Tale, you were pissed tell me about that reaction i was so pissed and it wasn't just like i was pissed in the beginning i just stayed pissed through the whole thing and completely <laughs> missed it like i could see i think what they were trying to do i'm like oh they're trying to make this cool and funny and whatever it did not matter because i was just upset from the start um <laughs> just 
just continue. But anyway, so that was it. Uh, but I couldn't leave because I was there with friends. I think I might have walked out had I gone alone. Uh, <laughs> but um, having watched some behind the scenes um, interviews with Brian, I understand what he was trying to do now with making it have a modern feel, um, portraying the joust as sort of like a concert tour that like groupies would go along and see their favorite band like play over and over again in all these different cities and have these big after parties um, and really like the whole like culture that was around it with um, dating or hooking up I guess would be like a modern modern equivalent of that um, but there there's like a romance uh, subplot to this movie and so I, I get it and he tried to show that by using like modern language, modern music, uh, modern mannerisms, uh, and even going so far as using the Nike logo, <laughs> like modern marketing uh, to get these jokes. And so like, yeah, okay, I get it. But like, I don't know, maybe this is a case of like a writer also being the director or a director being the writer for like this um, pet project piece. And it like just didn't really um, hit well for me. It, it just, I could see what was going on, but it just felt a little bit clumsy or like a, either not quite obvious enough or all the way. Um, so I'd say that's why it didn't really work for me. And so, okay. I think when this movie came out too, I think a lot of us uh, who saw the previews with the music and everything, were really thinking of 96's Romeo and Juliet by Baz Luhrmann, right? Which is super <laughs> famous at this point. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio and Clara Danes, John Leguizamo was in that, where they mixed contemporary setting uh, and, and music with the straight, sh well, almost straight, Shakespearean play dialogue, right? Which was a really <laughs> weird juxtaposition. Um, and I think this... I remember seeing A Knight's Tale and being like, oh, maybe they were trying too hard. Although I did end up warming to it as it goes on. And also it has Rufus Sewell in it, who is the lead in one of my all time favorite movies, which I almost chose as my love movie this week, which is Dark City with uh, Kiefer Sutherland, which is so freaking good. I um, like that one too. And of course, uh, I think everybody who loves Knight's Tale loves it partially because of Paul Bettany playing Chaucer. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his monologues and his drunken buffoonery in this film are excellent. And every time I see uh, a Marvel film with Vision in it, which of course he plays, I'm sad because they never give him any chance to act at all. Mm -hmm. At all. He's literally, it's, it's, it's like, oh, he's a robot. Well, he's basically a copy machine uh, that can walk around. <laughs> so that's a side note. So Knight's Tale, didn't work for you. Um, I think there are people who agree with you, although I think there's a lot worse. Do you have a worst moment in this one? I mean, I mentioned it was like the We Will Rock You just kind of like set it off. As Which, right, whatever. is literally the yeah. opening. I mean, <laughs> it's literally the opening. Um, but like the other really worst moment for me uh, was like the romance um, scene where uh, was it? Uh, Jocelyn tells Will to lose oh, the tournament God. because all of the other guys are saying, we'll win this tournament for you. So she wants the opposite, but it's just like this horribly toxic dynamic <laughs> going Man, into the romance. And Man, I just, Man. I just could even, I could not. <laughs> Mandy, I'm glad you pointed that out because by coincidence, just a couple of days ago, I watched Nice Tale with my wife. And that mm -hmm. moment, I was like, Bitch, I'm not losing for shit. I'm not losing for you. This is my job. Like, it also, was such a all my friends just bet all their money on this. <laughs> Not that he knew that, like he kept the secret, but you know, spoilers. But like, yeah, I was like, this is so, so terrible. Yeah, I feel um, like it was a very sort of, um, and anyone listening who is young or is immature romantically, that's okay. We all go through that. And uh, we all know each other on this podcast. I guarantee each one of us could probably point out some immaturity about each other at this point. <laughs> uh, that is that is that is across the board. Um, but it does seem like one of those like insane things that's just a trope from romances. And you see it and you're like, are you fucking madness like every time the the guy doesn't take or the or the woman now doesn't take the promotion and and just like oh, i thought you were supposed to be in france you are my france you know you're like no that's stupid that's really stupid like you should be the editor of vogue i don't know why you're back in you know pun up squat like it doesn't make sense 
Um, yeah, right. I, I get that. Right. So, so with all that considered, uh, what's a movie you would recommend to someone who's interested in Knight's Tale instead of Knight's Tale? Well, you stole my thunder a little because what I had put on my cheat sheet was the Romeo and Juliet because they really went there. Yeah. Like you want to see that juxtaposition, like much more serious. I uh, really went there. If you're a fan of Firefly and you just more want more Alan Duke, I never say his last name right. Um, <laughs> Tudic. <laughs> you just want more Alan in your life. Um, watch this movie because he does a great character called Watt, which is very similar to Wash from Firefly. So you can get a little bit um, um, a taste there for Lost Firefly love. And um, yeah, I guess that would be it. And I would say like, as far as other period films that maybe have like, um, like interesting romantic aspects or like a modern feel to them, I would recommend um, Elizabeth and Elizabeth the Golden Age with, you know, it's Kate Blanchett. Mm-hmm. Um, as, who is as a, wonderful yeah but neither of those are comedies they're both very serious fair fair <laughs> i i would throw in there uh also for me uh my wife introduced me to this film and i adore this film from 2004 stage beauty uh it was actually i believe it was actually an mtv production at the time but with billy crudup and again claire danes and rupert everett uh directed by richard Eyre. it's it's awesome it's about the transition of um of, of female character roles uh, in England being played by men into women. And uh, Billy Crudup is a, a, a gay man who has only made a career of playing women and now he's finding himself ousted. And it's, it's, it's a really brilliant film and it's absolutely hilarious as well. And it is a period film. The only thing that's a little problematic is the way they kind of play the end like a romance, which is after you've watched the movie, you're like, oh yeah, that, that's stupid. That's not canon. I literally am chopping this film off with three minutes left. Uh, but totally Stage Beauty 2004, give that one a go too. Uh, okay, so that is an interesting, uh, if controversial take, Mandy. Thank you so much. We're gonna go- You're welcome. We're gonna, <laughs> we're, gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna come here to Tad Mastriani. Tad, what is the film that you love? Bum Fights 3. Ah. No. Oh, we're going to start with my love. Yes, of course yes. we are. It's uh, Lance Mangia and Jeffrey Falcon's Six String Samurai from 1998, which okay. I'm fairly sure that Nate and Jeff and I have all watched together at some point. I watched this film because you recommended this, and I absolutely adore this film. Let's just play this clip uh, from this indie flick uh, from 1998, right? Is that what you said? Uh, it, it, this great. is from the trailer, and it's... It really sets things up nicely. In 1957, the bomb dropped. The last bastion of freedom became a place called Lost Vegas. And Elvis was crowned king. Now, his only heir has died. And Vegas needs a new king. There we go. It literally is a an Elvis Costello uh, lookalike with a, a, a dual acoustic electric guitar and a, a samurai sword. Samurai sword wandering a post apocalyptic desert. This is one, this was a movie that uh, I'm pretty sure that the reason I watched this movie was just because it was called Six String Samurai. I loved martial arts films. It was sitting in the, the shelf at, at a movie scene when I was working at the video store. And I thought to myself, you know what? This, is, this seems like my kind of movie. And boy, was it. And anyone who's listened to any of my comments on movies, I always talk about the soundtrack and how important that is to me. And this movie, it's jewel. It's shining red jewel in the middle. And I mean red on purpose, is the Red Elvises, which are, <laughs> which are a fantastic band. The introduction to them in this movie was probably my my favorite moment, but this movie hooked me right from the beginning. Just just a, a weird mix of a martial arts spaghetti western and a post apocalyptic Mad Max type movie with a bunch of stuff literally ripped right out of Star Wars while while we're at it. Why don't we just steal from everything? And it worked. And it only cost like two million dollars to make this movie. And you look at it and you think they probably could have made this movie for less. <laughs> could, have, could have made more of a profit that's that's totally that's I, totally accurate 
Yeah, I mean, the, the costumes are ratty, as you'd expect them to be. But at the same time, you look at them and they still feel crisp. Like someone put some real effort into every single one of them. The, 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 I mean, most of the plot is basically Buddy, the main character, is trying to get to Las Vegas. He runs into a kid called The Kid. This kid can't talk. All he does throughout the entire movie is, eh, this is <laughs> no. not, like, this kid is incredibly annoying. It's probably the only thing that I, that I knock this movie for is the fact that it's basically the silent sidekick, except, eh, and uh, I'm pretty sure they, they um, I feel, I, there's a lot of media that I feel references this movie that people would never realize because it's a, hard, it's a highly unknown film. For one yep. thing, I mean, I'll, I'll get to it later when I talk about my recommendation, but when you think about 2017's Logan and, and you think about how it's sort of kind of, I mean, it's a spaghetti, they're both spaghetti Western kind of style movies, so you're going to have that, but it was kind of interesting to think back and realize how much they improved that trope with X-23. X-23 was kind of annoying at first, but mm -hmm. she was feral. It was absolutely expected. And then this kid's feral too. So it was expected. Mm -hmm. It's just, one well, just, one it, just worked better than the other. And, and like you said, when you, when you mentioned their dynamic, um, it's really, it's, it's clearly a take on the lone wolf and cub, you know, uh, yep. uh, what has become the lone wolf and cub trope, which of course is based off um, the, the film series, which is itself based off the amazing classic manga series by Kazuo Kuiki and Goseki Kojima. And, it's 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 yeah it's basically a wandering samurai protecting this child who the child also ends up becoming helpful uh as as well as difficult uh to care for and it's it's got this and like you said the red elvis is doing the soundtrack i mean that rockabilly soundtrack you start to hear it in, in that trailer it is ever present and it is so brilliant and the characters um are so wackadoo like totally off the wall um and it really does play like a, a you know, Lone Wolf and Cub, Akira Kurosawa samurai epic, but with this 50s Vegas, like veneer uh, on this Mad Max landscape. And it's, it's brilliant. And you, like I said, you introduced this film to me and it has been literally on my head ever since, you know, 20 plus years later. <laughs> Don't even, don't touch my guitar, man. Don't even touch my guitar. <laughs> and, and like I said, he's an Elvis Costello lookalike. He's really a Buddy Holly lookalike, but uh, let's face it, Elvis Costello tries to look like Buddy Holly. Uh, so we talked about it. What's, do you have a favorite moment in this film? I mean, the, it's, I think it's the most talked about outside of the introduction with the Red Elvises. It's the, the final fight when basically Buddy is being chased by literal death throughout and and his and his gang of ring rates and the best part is that it's obvious that death is slash it's it's slash is chasing him you can't yes. you can't see his face but you also can't see slash's face so you don't know it's not slash but uh it's a it's a great same again it's the same parallel it's the the main character realizes he's not going to make it but the but he he sacrifices himself to give the kid some time and actually, the kid ends up just beating the beaten death anyway because it, it pulls the old uh, earnest Halloween bullshit spit on the bad guy, and all of a sudden, oh, they melt! Sweet, kill him! <laughs> right, it's the, it's the same trope that they used at the end of uh, of Harry Potter, the first you know Harry Potter, the first book, the Sorcerer's Stone, and the first uh, movie. You know, it's like, oh, it's the power of love in this stone that you know defeats him. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's kryptonite. I get it. Like, it just it just so happened to be there, but. I'll buy it because I enjoyed the ride. It was uh, it was probably the first in um, f film instance I ever saw of a sword duel that ended with a guitar duel, <laughs> and some and then someone getting pumped with arrows. So basically, it had everything. I I think it's pretty great myself, and it, I wouldn't be surprised if this popped up on uh, a future episode uh, panel discussion <laughs> on Cult and Classic podcast here. I just I want to say too, I think a lot of what you've mentioned comes down to the fact this is clearly a labor of love. Um, it was directed by Lance Mungia, uh, and it was written by Jeffrey Falcon, who plays Buddy and Lance Mungia, and it is um, it is as you said, uh, very intentional. 
everything is intentional. The costuming, even the sparseness of the set, it was all designed to work with what they had. Yeah. Um, and it, and because of that, it does. And, uh, and, and the idea of using a samurai film, which often these samurai films, like the, you know, the westernized version with The Last Samurai, they're about the end of this feudal way of the samurai, right? Like the, the in, encroachment of Western society and, and a different set of operating rules, uh, wiping out this, this cast of people. And then in this case, it's very similar uh, with this uh, Buddy Holly takeaway from this alternate 50s being pushed out by uh, this metalhead horseman, uh, kind, of, kind of easing that music into the past. So it's, it's really multi-leveled and it's a goofy premise with a goofy cast of characters and goofy scenes that really has a strong undercurrent of, um, of, of societal parallels, which I think is pretty cool. It's one of the reasons why I love the movie because for a cult film that basically ha hardly has a plot, there is an awful lot of symbolism if you if you dig a little bit, which I, I can't say about a lot of those cult films. You know, there's there's not always a whole lot of substance. It's usually just this is the plot. We wanted to be zany, and they they did it. They just you know there was some there was an, enough substance under it to to see there was a there was indeed a uh, there was a plan the whole time. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think I think that's fair criticism because. Uh, of, of cult films in general, because I love them, obviously, uh, as starting this podcast and writing about them for uh, the, the past decade. But um, like, I'm a huge Godzilla fan and Godzilla is, if there's a message, it's one note, which is uh, nuclear bombs bad. Uh, <laughs> that's, and that's pretty much clear and pretty much goes out the window as soon as we get to uh, a giant thunder lizard trashing buildings. Um, but like you said, this has more to it. And, uh, and, Jeffrey Falcon is basically discount Ray Park, which is probably why a lot of people still don't know who he is. And yep, if you don't know who Ray Park man. is, yeah, if you don't know who Ray Park is, that that you have bigger problems. <laughs> but uh, Jeffrey Falcon had a very long and storied career in Hong Kong film for years yep. before he made this, and it's 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 easy to see where he got some inspirations from when helping write the script. For sure, and I think if you for those for anyone who isn't familiar with Hong Kong cinema, it is my favorite. Um, my favorite cinema legacy, uh, partially because they make so many films. And yes, it is because of things like uh, non-standardized work hours and non-standardized safety procedures and things like that. But it's also because um, there's a love for cinema and it's for those people who make 76 movies in their lifetime, which is unheard of here, uh, every single one tends to have an aspect of themselves and this extra layer of thought put into it that you're like, oh, it's just an action movie. No, it's just an action movie uh, when we make, you know, hard way here in the West. Uh, but when they make it, there's a little bit more thought to it. Whether it's successful or not, that's up to debate. But there's some element in there, cultural or societal, that uh, is really interesting. And I think that's what you're getting at. So who would you recommend this film to? This is a recommendation I would make to people who obviously love Westerns, um, homages to Hong Kong cinema. Uh, just, you know, may maybe people who love the post-apocalyptic Mad Max style kind of movies, but also people who love the Fallout series because... <laughs> it was clearly inspired, and not only that, inspired Fallout later. Fallout, yes. if anyone, if listeners don't know, is a video game series based around the exact same premise. We get nuked, except it was basically by a large consortium of different um, communist nations in an alternate 1950s setting. And, uh, and basically, that's it. That's it. Humanity was thrown back so far, there's really no going forward anymore, except for Vegas. Turns out... In one of the sequels, Vegas was spared and is largely still functional. And the main character is wandering towards Vegas. Go fig. And there's now, actually an achievement in the game for, uh, killing, for killing a bunch of people with melee weapons. Yep, that's right. That reflects on Six String Samurai. And I will say this too. Uh, if you have even the slightest inkling or, have you, or you've had it in the past to play computer games, uh, if you've never played Fallout, the original Fallout, you can still buy on Steam and other platforms and... and, and uh, you know, DRM free download for like six bucks. Ridiculous. And it is, and it will run on, it doesn't matter if your computer is from 1998, it will run on a literal toaster. Okay. <laughs> you just have to plug a monitor in, play that game. Beautiful, it's beautiful, brilliant writing. Absolutely incredible. Uh, okay. So we've talked about the film you love, Tad. 
let's get to the film that you absolutely hate. What is it? I've been wanting to trash this fucking movie for 15 years now. It has it been 15 <laughs> years? Uh, Almost. So it's, it's pretty close. Uh, it's pretty close. So this is uh, The Science of Sleep from 2006, which is uh, the, probably the second work from Mikhail Gondry that people in the United States would recognize because Michael Gondry was unknown in, in America until 2004's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. So when I saw that this movie was coming out, I was all excited because I was a decent fan of Michael Gondry's work. This movie changed my fucking mind. <laughs> Let's well, let play a clip from the trailer of this movie because I think if you haven't really seen Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or uh, Be Kind, Rewind, some of his other films, uh, Michael Gondry's kind of style, you won't really know what kind of movie we're talking about. But I think that this little bit from the trailer really clues you in. If you close the door. So what's your name? Stefan. Stefan. Stephanie. Stefan, Stephanie. Click, click, catch match. She has no boyfriend. You can see real life in 3D. Isn't life already in 3D? Uh, yeah, but come on. <laughs> you might be thinking, huh? Yeah, that's the kind of movie. Okay, so Tad, first off, you saw this movie then because you enjoyed Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Absolutely. Okay. Why did this film not measure up? Let's, okay. let's go over this. First off, explain what the film is. Okay, so this film is basically a, uh, a, a depressing drama, a romantic drama disguised as a comedy. And one of my biggest problems with European cinema is that I get bait and switched like this all the time. They go. They advertise it as a comedy. It's so whimsical. It's gonna be great. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll bite. Let's, let's get in here. And then, nope, you get in there, and it's like, what in the fuck is going on in this movie? So that trailer is bait and switch number one. It sounds like it's going to be a happy, whimsical. This guy is just kind of like daydreaming all throughout his, his life, and he just gets into crazy mishaps. That's not what this movie's about. What this movie's actually about is a delusional, selfish, manic, depressive asshole who is terrible to all the women in his life, has a severe mental disorder that is clearly untreated and nobody in his life actually has pointed out to him, hey, you may need to get some help. But at the same time, he's a charming motherfucker when he is in his own head. And the main character, Stefan, is played by Gail, Garnier, Gail Garcia Bernal, who I love. I think he's a great actor. And he's very, when, he, when he's in the right role, he's a very charming guy. He, great, he plays great. He, he's got a, a great gravitas around him. This movie, was it wasted him because the first 10 minutes or so kind of loop you in because it starts off almost like feeling like a, you know, an old 90s MTV show. It's, uh, it's him at a, in, a, in what looks like a, a, like a newsroom or a studio, and he's talking and being charming. He's playing musical instruments and you know, talking about mixing some stuff together to make dreams and it's like all right this is getting me hooked in the intro is kind of psychedelic it's got the the lo-fi filter on it and i'm like okay i'm really gonna enjoy this when i rewatch this just to re just to ensure that i still hated this movie <laughs> and age has made it so that i hate it slightly less just because there are some redeeming qualities in this movie the visuals are one of them it's, this right, movie, it's kind of a peewee's playhouse kind of yes. insanity and, zaniness yes and they they do stuff a decent amount of that in the movie. He does have some moments where he kind of just drifts off in a la la land and he, he had, there's claymation or just weird stop motion all over the place. And it looks fantastic. It feels fantastic. The visual director did a great job with it. And, and it, Mikhail Gondry is kind of famous for that. Like he actually cut his teeth on a huge number of award-winning and well-known uh, music videos, right? Like you can actually go by collections of his music videos from Bjork and to White Stripes. To, like really, it's impressive. He's a great visual um, sort of maestro that way. Uh, but the man knows what he's doing. I think you're right, though. This this was a, a severe misadvertisement. It's not the first case. time this has happened to me, but yes. So. The basic plot is that his father dies and clearly he was very attached to his father and the movie doesn't really do a good job. Well, it, it, it kind of, there's an undercurrent that it's clear that he was very attached to his father because it's, I think that's what kind of drove him into the spiral that he's in right now emotionally. He isn't really coping with his father's death. And even I think the, the romantic 
interest, Charlotte Gainsbourg's character actually kind of makes a little joke on accident and feels really bad about it. About it's like, oh yeah, my father's still dead. <laughs> but um, he he ba his mother basically asks him to move back to France from Mexico, even though he's apparently not really all that good at speaking French. But this is actually one of those movies because it's um, actually I gave at this I I rewatched this on Super Challenge mode because it was dubbed actually no it wasn't no sorry it was subbed in dutch so i didn't have any english subtitles to go by and it's fortunate i know enough latin and french to kind of to get by and know, remember what people are talking about but it switches constantly between english french people are doing it all the time in random spots in the movie and it's just because you know it's 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 a it takes place in a workplace where people are multilingual and it's normal it doesn't feel jilted or it doesn't feel weird people just kind of switch languages it, it happens it's not a big deal but basically he comes back to france his mother does everything to set him up so that he can like live a normal life again after literally flying halfway across the world he's very much not appreciative of it basically just like sleeping in what looks like a kid's bed daydreaming hates the job that was that he got because never mind you know I, I, we have all done it. We got to work so we can live. Very much not appreciative. Well, I get it. He, he, uh, he brings his stuff to the boss because he's a creative dude. And he was told this was a creative job, except all of his creative stuff is highly violent or um, very, very, very sociopathic almost. And basically the boss is like, get the fuck out of my, uh, my office. What is wrong with you? And uh, throughout, the, throughout the film, when he's daydreaming, he's charming. But in real life, everything is either boring as shit because he's either talking to coworkers or talking to women and doing a very poor job of it, or he's having a fucking tantrum. Like, <laughs> like literal tantrums. He's, he is a giant man child with basically no redeemable qualities whatsoever in reality. So the movie does a great job of sticking him into these surreal situations to make him look like he's actually somewhat of a decent person, somewhat redeemable. And then reality sna snaps in and wow, he's fucking terrible. He's still fucking terrible. At the end of the movie, he's still fucking terrible. There has been no advancement for this character whatsoever. There's, there's no redemption arc like there is in there's The none. Life Aquatic, the Steve Zezu or something where there's the final moment where you're like, ah, oh, at least he made peace with his child, you know? Like that sort of thing. It sort of reminds me of a less, um, uh, of, of adult, um, what is it? Uh, 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 young adult um, with Charlize Theron, except without um, Diablo Cody's like sharp edge humor and 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 sarcasm. Um, it also, when you're talking about why you hate this film, it reminds me of uh, a Western award-winning film, Silver Linings Playbook, which uh, only barely missed my this time's hate it week. I hate that film because <laughs> for a similar thing, it's the most First off, it's 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 a comedy drama romance is what they marketed it as. It is not funny. Uh, it is not romantic, and the dramatic part is just super shallow. It is the most shallow interpretation of mental illness I have seen play in cinema uh, quite some time. There are, there are serial killers in you know direct to video horror films where there's more depth to mental illness um, because you're basically saying. This guy's a manic depressive. Uh, she is like bipolar with, uh, which I guess they're now the same thing. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist, but with a, a, a problem where she sleeps with people to get affection and then pushes them away. And um, they're going to fix each other by going together because that's what happens. It's like if you took two beer bottles and you smashed them on the street and then you crammed them together. And you're like, look, it's a beer bottle. It's not how it works. You just get a handful of glass. I think you just explained how America handles mental illness. It, terrible. Absolutely terrible. I cannot believe it won Best Picture. Literally the most terrible. And fine. Jennifer Lawrence, people like her. I'm not a, a particular huge fan, but whatever. Bradley Cooper, great actor. Love him as Rocket Raccoon. Differentiates himself in the role. I mean, Robert De Niro, you gave Chris Tucker another role. Thank you. Uh, but the movie's bad. It's a bad movie. Uh, and people and should feel, feel people should feel bad about about raising it up as some sort of beautiful story. It's it's not. It's a terrible, terrible story. Okay. Thank you, Tad. What movie would you recommend instead of The Science of Sleep? I would recommend Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind because it's basically the same fucking movie. Literally, <laughs> it's the same goddamn movie. And he went, you know what? I made this movie. America loves it. I'm going to make the French version. And it sucked. And of course, Eternal Sunshine is... He, 
he worked on the story, but he also worked with Charlie Kaufman on the story, uh, whereas uh, he wrote um, Science of Sleep by himself. And Charlie Kaufman has written some, some great movies, including being John Malkovich and adaptation and some other things. So we totally, we can see where some of that maybe uh, Kaufman maybe reined in some of Gondry's more mm, bizarre tendencies. Because in a way, it sounds almost like Gondry's um, style of working is similar to the concept of how the character's reacting, right? Like, he's got this great stuff, but he's so self-sabotaging by having zero editing and zero ability to control his real-life interactions. It's a, it's a common problem, and it, it's even a problem in Eternal Sunshine. Michael Gondry's um, writing tends to lean to, a, to a, a sort of realism. It's like realism inception, where it's actors trying to act like real people inside a movie so nothing feels genuine in the slightest it all feels produced yes and so so even when things are trying to be realistic there's a tinge of just something's off with everybody in the world right now like everybody's just like what is wrong with you <laughs> why are you the way you are yes yes and unfortunately although I will say that uh science of sleep if you're interested in contemporary uh uh, adult actors, meaning that they're not the new rung of, of, of 20 year olds and teens in French cinema. Uh, the science of sleep is like a who's who. There are so many uh, amazing cast members in that film. And it's sort of like Eternal Sunshine did the same thing, right? It, you got Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, Eliza Wood, Mark Ruffalo, David Cross, Kirsten Dunst, Tom Wilkinson. I mean, it was, it was really, uh, it seemed like a very small cast, but then you realize that the cast is small, but very talented and very skilled. Very so, much. Uh, Okay. Oh, before you guys move on, yes, I would like to say that I purchased the Science of Sleep out of a bargain bin at like that probably a blockbuster oh, for a couple of dollars, and I never watched the whole movie, and I couldn't remember why. But when you started talking about, it, I'm like, oh yeah, it was just I didn't want to spend any time with that person. I'm like, sure. yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm, I bought it and never watched the whole thing. I can only imagine it's even more uncomfortable as a woman watching it because it's like this guy's a huge asshole and the every woman in the sh in the movie except for uh i can't remember uh christine i think the the office chick the blonde office chick she's the most entertaining one because she actually has a personality and everybody else does charlotte gainsbourg basically phoned in the entire thing and apparently she's a great actress but i haven't watched anything else with her in it yeah Just i read up front with that i think thank uh, you for saving me from ever watching the whole thing you're welcome and i'm hoping i'm saving everyone else listening too <laughs> oh man i have to watch this movie now <laughs> and, and christine is christine is played by and i probably will say her name wrong but it's like meow meow uh is is what her name is and she's been acting in french cinema for decades uh she's she's a very strong actress so and that's probably why she got that role um as the as the the saner the, the more well-balanced person uh, okay, we're gonna go. Uh, we're gonna go to our good friend Jeff. How are you doing, Jeff? Good. Okay, I'm glad because you make these. Uh, just so everyone listening knows, Jeff makes hand motions when I ask him things sometimes, which is interesting because we're an audio medium. So um, I'm just gonna have to hire someone to just whisper into the microphone. It's like thumbs up, you know, like asterisk wave, asterisk shark mouth. Like I don't know. Okay, so. Jeffrey, what is the movie that you love? <laughs> well, I guess I'm getting beat up today. Uh, <laughs> we love you, Jeff. I'm happy you're here. I'm always happy for some Jeff. So my favorite movie is clearly the best of the group, uh, but also probably not something we would ever do on this show because I think it's a little probably too well known. Uh, it would be Snowpiercer. Um, yeah. Uh, this 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 particular movie. Uh, I went in with zero expectations and it kind of rocked my socks off. Uh, I've been looking for them ever since. Uh, can't find them, um, but it was worth it. Um, Let's listen to a clip here. This is, it's Snowpiercer, for those of you listening, from 2014, which is the film version. It's adapted from the comic book starring Chris Evans, not the new uh, television series based off Snowpiercer, which... Uh, I haven't seen the new series, but word is is that it's sub, it's subpar compared to the film. But we're talking about the film today, and let's listen to this clip from uh, the trailer. This chaos, a thousand people in an iron box. Eighteen years I've hated the train. Eighteen. 
18 years I've waited for this moment. This is your world. The train saved humanity. The engine lasts forever. The population must always be kept in balance. I said sit down. So, that's the trailer. It's a tense post-apocalyptic future, but it's a different kind of post-apocalyptic future than, say, Six String Samurai, which is more what we're used to, right, Jeff? That's correct. So, th this, this entire film takes place on a train, um, and we, we kind of open up in kind of this um, kind of dank, crowded, um, dark uh, portion of the train that uh, is, is described as the tail. Um, and so basically all the characters that, that we're getting to know are uh, these denizens of the tail. Um, and they eat these, you know, black bricks uh, that are called like protein bricks or whatever. Um, and they get these notes basically in these bricks uh, kind of inciting a revolution or rebellion um, against the front of the train, which is... Uh, basically in control they have the weapons uh they have the you know security codes to all the doors um and you know at first you don't really know what this movie is um you know you you kind of you get you get to know a couple of the characters in the back and you know clearly there's a rebellion gonna happen uh, but you know like what what is this movie and uh you know it turns out to be you know this uh science fiction like you know film that deals with all kinds of issues from uh you know global warming economy uh class systems societal systems uh you know uh, philosophical ideas um it goes it goes kind child of labor. all the gamuts yeah child labor mm -hmm. it, it, there's like a million different things and we could talk about it for six seven hours just about all of the uh, kind of uh, you know ideas that this film brings up um but it's also just a gorgeous like action film i guess um it has um some you know beautiful scenes you know from the outside of the train like the the train every once in a while you know opens up into an area where you can see out into the world that's frozen um and you know theoretically all of you know, mankind is surviving on this train and everybody else in the world is frozen to death. Um, and, you know, without, without, I don't want to destroy the whole film, but basically the, it's, it's a, it's a adventure film where our main characters are trying to get to the front of the bus, uh, front of the train and take it over uh, basically. And it's almost like Alice in Wonderland because they're basically going through all of these strange worlds uh, basically one train car at a time um, and it slowly reveals what this world is um, until you kind of finally get to the to the end of the the train um, and you know like everything becomes revealed and uh, like some like some lines from the earlier you have um, Gillian who's kind of the leader of the uh, the, uh, the tail uh, all of the the poor people, the have-nots. The caboose. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, kind of the guy who's he's trying to pass the leadership off to, um, uh, Chris Evans' character. And Chris Evans says, like, I, I can't be the leader because, you know, I have both my arms. And you're just like, this line comes through and you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Like, what, like, what is, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Those words are not, those are mean, words are meaningless. Um, but it turns out they're very meaningful. Um, and in kind of a, a, a pretty impactful way later. So it's like just such a smart script. Uh, like it, it, it lays in these kind of like foundational things, but like not in a boring way. You're not like slogging through this dialogue being like, oh, this, this is all foreshadowing for the future. <clears throat> um, they really sneak it in there so that, uh, you know, like later on all these, these uh, reveals and, and, uh, plot twists are just and, deeply satisfying and i'll say i i missed this film when it was released and it was a low a small release uh, in yeah. the u.s and i deeply regretted it because as you said um 
the pedigree of this movie is incredible. And just to say, so the the story is based off um, a French French comic uh, story, which anyone who knows heavy metal knows that French comic strips are epic in their portrayal of societal uh, constructs put into the weirdest most insane boxes and and examined down to the most minute um uh the most minute kind of microcosms to really show us how frankly terrible we are um and it, it, the the original story is um by uh jacques Loeb. Uh, excuse me I'm, my french is terrible but jacques Loeb, benjamin legrand and jean-marc rochette and uh more impressively for film buffs like us, uh, Bong Joon-ho, the, the famed Korean filmmaker at this point, and I would hazard to say probably the best uh, working filmmaker in the world right now. If anyone hasn't seen uh, Parasite that came out uh, just last year, 2019, truly, uh, he, he wrote that and, and directed it. And it is, in my opinion, the best film that I've ever seen. Uh, and probably is gonna be hard to top in the way that it deals with um, it manages the art of storytelling uh, and pairs it with uh, excellent visuals and this overwhelming amount of societal pressure subtext that uh, anyone who is a human being will likely be able to relate to, even though the situation is hopefully for many of us kind of far, far fetched. Uh, so he, he wrote um, the screenplay for this with Kelly Masterson and also directed it. And so the, the beautiful visuals uh, combined with the smart script is, is no surprise. And for anyone who's only seen Parasite and thought, well, it's beautiful and great, but I mean, this is a science fiction movie. His first big hit was The Host, which is a, a sort of a, a reimagination of uh, the monster film. So, which is also a great film. I don't think it's on the level of, of Snowpiercer or, or of course Parasite, but I do think it's worth a watch. The, the film version of Snowpiercer, um, the TV show of course has a great cast. Jennifer um, Connelly is in there, who's fantastic. But the cast for this, the 2013-2014 film is so good. You have uh, Kang Ho Song, who is a great uh, Korean actor. And then you have Chris Evans, Ed Harris, our good friend John Hurt from Partners, getting a good role. Uh, Tilda Swinton, who's amazing. Jamie Bell. Octavia Spencer is in this. Um, Steve Park is in this. Just really amazing. And it's a big cast. As you said, there are, every time they go through these, these different sort of separate worlds, so to speak, in the train cars, there's like a whole new cast. Um, so I think that it's sort of a perfect storm with a smart script and a great cast and a good visual direction. You have a movie that I really don't understand how this movie didn't get a wide release and wasn't sort of exploded at the time. And I can only imagine it's because it was a Korean director, no matter how famous that Korean director was becoming yeah. at the time. Um, I mean, that, that's kind of why I, whenever somebody says like, hey, what's like a, a, a film that's like on your favorite system? Like, I have to say this just because, like, it really should have been bigger than it was. Yeah. It, it was, in my mind, underrated significantly. And I think, and I mean, it, it was well received, but also, I mean, at the time, yes, it's not that long ago, but it's, an, it's over two hours, which for, pe for what was sort of pegged as an action film is a little long. Yeah. Um, but like you said, it's so much. It's not an action film. It's I not mean, an it action film. It kind of is, but it's not. Right. It's more of a science fiction, like, th like, I, like I'll, I'll, I'll skip ahead to, like, who wants to watch this. Uh, yeah, like, let's do the it. The people who are, like, really would be, like, people who like Star Trek. I know it's kind of, like, a weird connection, but it's, it's such a complex world mm -hmm. that they're creating, and there's so many issues built in there. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's like five episodes of Star Trek, like, jammed into one with the beautiful action. It's, it really is, like, the thing that all Star Trek – uh, fans want to see in a movie it's mm. beautiful mm -hmm. cinematics mixed with all of this beautiful kind of um, like concepts of philosophy and um, like you know, societies well, and, and world building and stuff and you get it, it makes me think when you said that I, I was thinking it through and it makes me think of the original series of star trek where base i mean where every single episode was there were a few exceptions but the vast majority were here is this new place it has strange customs. Let's watch this group of people who are similar to us, at least in our ideals for the time, 
navigate this new system and figure it out. And they're going to show us something about us by doing that. And you get, um, you know, the, essentially the, the low class citizens, you know, with Chris Evans being the primary placeholder for us are the, the normal people. Right. And they're the ones that you see all this insanity and it, it gets to a kernel of truth about our own operations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I don't want to like ruin it too much. Like there's like, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Like, are they, are they really, uh, you know, the heroes? Cause like, you know, the, Chris Evans character at the end, like he almost, you know, buys into it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it, he's like, he's a millimeter away. Cause, cause you know, I mean, again, it's like an experiment. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that's why Star Trek is so interesting. It's like, you know, human, the, this whole thing that we're doing here on this planet, you know, the, the United States, uh, Europe, like it's all an experiment. Like we're all just like trying to like figure it out. Nobody's done it right yet. Uh, no, <laughs> there's no prototype for like running a country perfectly. It's never happened. Hopefully it will someday, but you, you know what I mean? There's, there's yep. none of that. So this really is more philosophical. It's like, it's really just presenting ideas. It's like, here's a thing that could happen. Uh, it, it, I'll spoil it a little bit. They get to the end and it's, nobody had the right answer at the end. Uh, yeah. Very clearly, it's basically chaos, like Chris Evans said in the uh, trailer. The trailer there. Th- there's no like nice resolution. It's not like, ah, well, the, the, the people in the back had a better answer than, than uh, you know, Wilford and his, you know, pretty clearly wrong answer. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, like who, who knows, who knows the right, who knows? Maybe that was the best, the most well, optimum way to do it. Who knows? And, and I think, interestingly enough, for our more um, schlocky cult film lovers like myself, it sort of reminded me of uh, the 1998 film that Mystery Science Theater loves and Rift Tracks did as well recently live uh, in the last couple of years, Space Mutiny from 1998, where uh, the idea is that uh, Earth was no longer livable. So, And this has been done in, in better science fiction novels as well. But they built this giant space arc and basically like, okay, in however many generations of people, we're all going to live on this ship. Uh, they will eventually get to a planet and halfway in between uh, a group is like, nope, we're going to make a deal with these pirates and get the hell off here because we're not going to live our lives on a ship. And it's sort of like at that kind of interesting, it reminded me of that at a much more elevated level. And I also want to say, because I thought it was interesting, the guy who directed Space Union 1998, which has a slight attachment to this, uh, his name is David Winters, and he actually played uh, Arab in... Uh, West Side Story. So interesting little tidbit there. Uh, Yeah, so sounds good. Snowpiercer, love it. Star Trek fans. All right, uh, the moment though, that that, uh, my favorite moment uh, was, and this was the part where I just like fell in love. Uh, They open a door and there's just this like army of people. And it was just like, oops, we probably shouldn't open that door. Uh, So there basically is the army of the tail facing off against this army of the front but the army of the front is weird as fuck they're like they're all like wearing like full leather like outfits and they have axes what's weird about that jeff flooding their axe in a fish and and that kind of like it kind of comes into play a little bit later he's kind of start to understand the metaphor of the fish but anyways at the time you're just like what the, what the, <laughs> what's going on and it's just it's it's it, it and then like halfway through that scene they stop and uh, do a countdown for New Year's, and they, it's, it's, it's so strange, but like it, it, it's somehow just fit, like it's like oh yeah, that would happen in this world. Like it just, all of it clicks, um, and so there's just so many beautiful details in this thing that is just uh, and. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to rag on anyone who loves like, I, there's so many things I love that my wife is like, how can you like that? That is hot garbage. And I'm like, no, but to me, it gives me something I'm looking for. And, and, and I don't want to say that's the case for people who like say hunger games, which fine, that's just your thing. That's cool. But it's sort of like how people acted very, where they were very impressed by hunger games, sort of world building and this sort of insane culture that could build off of what we have now. And it sounds like Snowpiercer takes that to like the, the true level of, no, this is what would be insane. And you can trace it all the way back to logic that we have now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it's awesome. You've got me sold. Uh, it's been on my list for a while. I will definitely check that out. Well, you haven't seen it yet? I have oh! not seen it. I have not seen <laughs> it. 
I know, I know. <laughs> I know this is where it comes out, but see, that's why, we, that's why we do these things. Dude, go so, watch it tonight. Oh, it's on Netflix. <laughs> I'm I, I will my absolutely. Password. Wait, no, I won't. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I will not give you my password. You're gonna have to pay for that shit. Yourself. I have Netflix. <laughs> I spend all the money I don't have uh, anyway on 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 things where I can watch things that I. It's been sitting in my queue since it came out on Netflix, so that's been quite a few years now. Uh, all right, we're gonna move on. Uh, what film do you hate? All right, I mean this. This I, I think almost everyone described their, except for Greg, uh, an element of expectation. So this this movie uh, came out in two thousand and one, uh, and it was heavily like advertised on some channels or something uh, mm -hmm. at was. the time, and. I remember, like, specifically, like, kept, you know, bringing up, like, Jet Li as, like, a producer of the film. And this mm -hmm. was, like, kind of in the time when he was doing some, like, amazing stuff. Um, this was kind of, like, at the peak of his career. He was, like, doing uh, all kinds of epic films. He'd, with... he'd come off of being the villain in Lethal Weapon 4, and American audiences yeah. saw him and loved him. And all of a sudden, he started, which was 98, I think. And all of a sudden, he started... Yeah like being all over the place. So by 2001, he was like an action icon in the US. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so I was sold on it. Um, and unfortunately, you know, it is, you know, hot garbage. Um, <laughs> and, you know, obviously uh, had enough, like, I, I think even Mel Gibson was on, like on the-, the He ads. was a producer, that is correct. Um, they both produced it you know not to say that he hasn't ruined his own brand his own way but <laughs> at that time he was hot shit too um and uh so you know i was sold i, I bought into the marketing i was excited about this film i actually bought it and it came in a box i remember opening the box i opened the package i put the dvd right in i started watching it and basically this movie uh has um you know, the soundtrack of my inner child dying. That's, that's what the soundtrack is. Because it immediately was just like, oh, this, uh, all the, like, that excitement, you know, that built up, it was turning into, like, this jaded jackass that I am now. Um, and that, that was, you know, one of the moments that was, you know, building into that. Because, um, you, you know, and that's, and now I know, you know, people are going to sell shit based on, you know, a brand, you know, you go to the store and you get a shirt that says Gap on it, you know, they're, you know, it's a garbage shirt that's going to disintegrate in like two weeks. They're selling you the name. Um, I actually don't know anything about Gap, so maybe their shirts are great. I'm just giving you, like, it's, a, it's a common thing. I learned it then, you know, with my inner child dying. Um, but like this movie really is, it's like, it's that's like if um, the Power Rangers tried to do like Ang Lee, or uh that is a really Jane good Mo. description that's a really it, good description let's listen to this clip because yeah. we're gonna hear billy zane talk and i'm a huge billy zane fan um Love but there's there's no question i mean my wife and her entire family they constantly quote you like lamb don't you sweet pea from his character in titanic all the time he's a great character actor great guy uh as far as i know uh he could be a terrible person i don't know him personally billy give us a call uh let me know colton classic podcast at gmail.com but what I will say is um, he's forced to deliver some really, really questionable dialogue in this movie. And this clip's going to show it to us. This is from Invincible 2001. Uh, this, is also, this is the second film in 2001 to come out called Invincible. This is the TV movie version uh, that stars Billy Zane. So let's take a listen. This tablet was unearthed yesterday. Extremely powerful. I have one half. The Shadow Men have the other. If the Shadow Men put the two halves together, they'll have the key to open up the vortex. We have four days to stop them. If we don't, the air will become fire, the oceans will boil, and metal will rain from the skies. Yeah, so literally, um, this is what I imagine happened there. I imagine Billy Zane uh, came out of the, he didn't have a trailer for this, let's be honest. He came out of uh, his car, they directed him where to go, they gave him like a black robe and uh, they said, this is inside a warehouse or a dance club. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Just go in there and you're going to say something about a tablet destroying the world. If they get two halves, this could be any single movie from the nineties 
featuring, uh, which again is 2001, featuring uh, a tablet that's broken into two. Like this is, this, Jackie Chan Adventures saw this and said, no, 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 we're gonna do this way better. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna let yeah. you take this I, away. I mean, I don't like, I actually haven't watched it since then. Uh, I tried a little bit, like I, I gave it like just the smallest, smallest effort to go and find it. I found like a 10 minute clip on YouTube for this film. I don't remember it. I'll be honest with you. It's bad. Like the dialogue's bad. The story's bad. The effects are bad. The fight scenes are bad. Um, they literally put together a pretty nice trailer off of, you know, just something that could not possibly be cut into like scenes. Well, and like you like, said, it's it was heavily pushed on TV because that's where it aired. Yeah. It was a TV movie. And what's crazy about it is um, it was aired as being produced by uh, Mel Gibson and Jet Li. And everybody remembered, oh, man, I, I like uh, at the time, like Lethal Weapon 4 had come out on video. And it was like, oh, yeah, that was so great. And they're so great together and that, that ending fight scene. And then when it came out, both of them had had their names removed off it. Uh, so in the credits, if you watch the original, they're not listed, mm -hmm. even though they did in fact produce the film along with some other people. And also here's some interesting fact. So the, the writers, there are, uh, five writers on this, which is always a good sign. Uh, <laughs> two of them, two of them, to be fair, just worked on the story and they're the, the writing pair of Carrie W. Hayes and, uh, Chad Hayes, who, uh, wrote the Conjuring, uh, series, uh, the one and two, as well as um, White Out with Kate Beckinsale, which was based on a comic book, which was okay. Um, and the 2005 House of Wax, which was actually decent. So they've written a lot of horror films. They did the story for this, which again, I assume is just a photocopy of the back of a Power Rangers VHS box with the name scratched out. And then the actual uh, script writers um, are, are, are Michael Brandt and uh, and, and Derek Haas, and they've both worked together on a variety of action films, some of them pretty decent. I mean, they wrote the uh, 310 to Yuma remake in 2007 with Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. They did the Wanted comic book adaptation in 2008, which, you know, it has, it, it works. Um, they also wrote Too Fast, Too Furious, so uh, I don't know, you're 50-50. But again, these are people that actually work and they write scripts that are better than this one. Um, but also I will say that uh, Jeffrey Levy, who is the director of this film, also had a hand in writing it. And you always wonder, that one person that throws everything off, you always wonder if that's him because Jeffrey Levy has not made a great deal of, of high profile films. And he tends to direct one episode of things um, which, you know- He's like a four hire director basically. Yes, yeah, and, 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 and not really sure he, he never stays on a project very long. I don't know if that tells us something. Sometimes it does. I don't want to jump to conclusions, but um, not a clue, not a clue uh, about, about his, his career after this, but this seemed to be the attempt to break into the mainstream and wow, did it not work? Uh, yeah. So, so let's go into what's your, do you have a worse moment for this one? Um, honestly, it was, uh, yeah, just uh, the, the soul crushing, moment there yeah just the the losing the losing of faith in people was really the the thing that I hit uh pro probably I, I think the thing that that got me is there's a scene where and and I got this from re-watching that bit uh so one character is running and then a character runs behind them and then kind of like jumps on I'm sorry I'm, I have to do this with my hands I will try to describe this clearly jumps onto their shoulders with their legs like over their shoulders, but they're like leaning all the way back. So they're basically making, uh, you know, a, you know, a an upside down capital L, an upside down capital L. Thank you. Uh, and then another person comes up and runs and jumps onto the chest of the uh, the 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 top part, the bar horizontal of the L, person, <laughs> and then and gets launched kind of like a catapult with this weird awkward thing, and it looks, it's I mean it's just. I, it's it looks ridiculous it's like a ridiculous premise the whole thing it's just it's so laughable but like not not funny at the same time <laughs> i don't know it's painful 
Are you sure you just weren't watching uh, Cirque du Soleil? <laughs> Man, if people were actually doing that and it wasn't just some bad wire work, it would be so amazing. <laughs> I remember so amazing. wire work in two thousands. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, and and if you're if you're if you're hearing that and you're thinking of like um, Joseph McGinty, Nicole, or McGee, uh, the director who who did uh, the uh, two thousand Charlie's Angels series. Um, who I will defend, okay, because those were fine, and he did a good job with Terminator Salvation, in my opinion. But you're right on, but worse. Like the like, at least he knew that physics were not going to be at play in his directing. Invincible really has these things because I was I was super excited. I remember I was staying at my grandparents' house in Phoenix, Arizona, which is not where I lived, and I was like, I have to. F I found some videotape they had somewhere, and I recorded over that videotape at their house in order to, uh, to capture what was sure to be the best film to be a TV movie in, in a many a moon. And I was as gobsmacked as you were at how truly bad this movie was. Now, are there worse films? Sure, yeah. sure. Is there any reason why this film was this bad? No, absolutely not. Never in a million years. I don't understand why. This was so. This was done so poorly, and it actually has a decent cast. It's got a lot of stunt people playing roles, which is always a nice thing to give. And of course, it has Billy Zane. It also has Dominic Purcell from uh, uh, Prison Break and Blade Trinity, who played Dracula. Um, you know, so I mean, it's not like these. It's not like they. It's not like they had no talent, right? Like I mean, there were there were things to do in this in this mm -hmm. movie that they there were things to work with, and they didn't do it. And um, and, and why did they push it so hard? I, like, why I couldn't they have just been like, we made a know. shitty film. Let's just let it, like, you know, slide out in the night. Uh, you know, like, try, like, play off the, like, kind of the cheesiness of it. You know, like, sell it like a Power Rangers, you well, know, like, you know. Sell it like a Sharknado. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Like, sell and, it what it is. Cause... And this is what, this is what, if you look for the, the current DVD release, which is still in circulation, um, the the cover you know they always have a blurb they they i don't know how hard they had to find something that they could chop all grammar out of to make it sound like a positive um because the only one they have is matrix like martial arts with an exclamation point from the austin chronicle now i bet you there was no exclamation point at the end of that original quote i i bet you that that sentence read failed matrix like martial arts makes viewers question their decision to buy a television like that's what i imagine <laughs> that sentence read like yes um, so but with that said i will say this is a unique oddity the, the dvd even still says um uh executive produced by mel gibson and Jet Li. yet the credits unless they've changed it since its original airing of uh, which i have a vhs copy of somewhere uh, their names were removed from the production. So I don't know what favor was being called in by Jeffrey Levy to get this done. I don't know. But uh, it it's, that's what it was. Nate, so, you would own a copy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? A, that's not a question. I run Cult and Classic Podcast. Jeff, what movie would you recommend people watch instead of Invincible 2001 by Jeffrey Levy? I got an answer for you, sir. All right. So one, if you want some science fiction action, which is kind of what this was kind of trying to be billed as, go watch Equilibrium. Came out kind of in a similar time period and is freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, if you haven't seen it, it's Daniel it's, Craig, right? Uh, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Uh, I think it, I think it would still because the, the action in that has like such a uh, kind of like unique style and like kind of visual um, appearance to it, like the whole thing. Uh, that is, it, it's, I think it would still be interesting. And me. interestingly enough, Dominic Purcell is also in that film. So, hey. got around back then. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I would, I would go with that if you want the science fiction action. If you just want some good wire work, go watch. You know, almost any of the you know kind of those epic uh, movies that Jet Li and Jackie Chan were making during that period. Go watch Hero, uh, House of the Flying Daggers. You know, go back for Ang Lee's uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, watch something good with some like good wire work. Like, cause I, I think that stuff even holds up now. Cause it's just, sure. it's, it's beautiful art. Um, it's ballet mixed with your yeah, martial arts. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Anything, any Sue Hark work is great too. So yeah, I, I, I think that that's a, a solid, uh, solid recommendation. All right. We've come to my choices. Um, now 
I'll, I'll, I'll keep it relatively brief here, but this is a clip from the trailer for my I Love It film. Wanna talk tough movies? Here's a superhero with the biggest pair of all. You looking for me? That she was just walking down the street singing. This Elvira is a slimy, slithering succubus, a concubine, a streetwalker, a trap. Yes, she's got it all. <laughs> yes, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, 1988. Mm. This is one of my all-time favorite go-to films. Of course, Elvira is a character uh, that, that started on late night uh, horror movies where she would uh, introduce and make fun, sort of all the mystery science theater, pre-mystery science theater horror films. Uh, Cassandra Peterson is the actress who plays Elvira and has made Elvira both a household name and truly a, a business which has, has spanned her life. And she's phenomenal and I she's my hero and this movie was her first feature length film there's a second one uh, that came out many moons later in the 2000s called uh, Elvira's Haunted Hills which is a period film it's still entertaining but this one the original uh, hour and 36 minutes of gold this is truly a great movie in my opinion James Signorelli uh, directed this film and uh, James you know he made plenty of, of cult famous movies. Um, he also worked uh, on a lot of films. He worked on uh, um, Phantom of Paradise, uh, which was uh, Brian De Palma, interesting film. He's worked on Saturday Night Live as director for, uh, I don't know, 30 million years since the 90s to now, or almost now. So it's got that sort of schlocky comedy pedigree. And uh, it really plays out like, the best of the 80s comedies. There's some weird action scenes. There's a funny dog with a colored mohawk. There's tons of sex jokes, um, but it's all in this PG-13 realm. And it's really great. And you've got um, uh, Phil Rubenstein plays a director in an interesting sort of meta moment. Uh, Tress McNeil is in it. Uh, if you watch it, you'll be like, oh, I've seen every single person on this in other 80s films. And that's sort of where this movie lives, solidly in the late 80s. Uh, there's, some of the humor is so dorky that it's charming. I mean, you'd think things that sound terrible, um, they're actually funny. You find yourself laughing, even though you're like, this is dumb. Like when she's trying to eat a hot dog from the gas station in the car and the hot dog falls out of the bun between her breasts. You're like, that's not funny, but I'm laughing. Why does it work? And it's all because of Cassandra Peterson's charm as this character, this super, she's sultry, but super ditzy, but also very confident and self-established and it's sort of what we all i would think strive to be uh is like i don't have to be the smartest one in the room i just have to be me and that's gonna work and it totally does for her and it centers around her uh helping uh, a hunky dorky really dumb guy uh rebuild a theater so they can show old schlocky horror movies and it ends with a hilarious um music number with uh, Elvira doing like an 80s rap montage while she's uh, twirling pasties. It's way out there. It's a great film. If nobody's ever seen this movie, I don't know what you're doing with your life, but it's clearly off the rails and you need to watch this film. Um, it, it's, it, it's an interesting history for this. Um, it, it sort of had uh, some troubled production. It had a distribution deal because um, it was produced by NBC by New World Pictures. Um, but just when it was going to hit theaters, New World filed for bankruptcy. New World Pictures made um, a lot of great cult films or rather distributed a lot of great cult films. Uh, and the movie, like it was supposed to hit nationwide. It was cut dramatically uh, to like a few thousand theaters uh, to a few hundred. So real, real bad. Uh, critics ripped it apart. They stopped promoting the film and it bombed, but it became a bestseller on VHS and one of the highest rated uh, views when NBC aired it in 1992 years later. So what comes around goes around. Uh, and I also, as an interesting fact, I don't know if they still do this. I work for colleges and I, and I, and I, in my other life, and I'm not sure that this is still a thing, but it used to be that when you applied for college, you would have an option or you'd be required to put down a quote from someone that you admired. Do you guys remember having to do that at all? Yep. 
Yep. So I, I don't know if you guys remember who you chose for a quote. Um, I think they've done away with that. Uh, it's probably a good idea considering how many celebrities and comedians have now been accused or uh, convicted of terrible, terrible crimes. It's probably, probably a wise decision. But on every single application, including my grad application, I put down uh, this quote from Elvira from this film, which is, um, I'm going to read it to you verbatim. Uh, when all is said and done, I only ask that people remember me by two simple words any two, as long as they're simple. That truly, and that's why I didn't get into college for a few years. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I that, that computes, man, that tracks. <laughs> I, I love this movie and it makes me super happy. Um, my favorite scene, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, every single scene she's in makes me happy, but that is a cop out. I do like when the evil sorcerer, uh, Vincent, who's trying to steal her, her, her uh, essentially a uh, book of shadows grimoire um, that's been given to her. Um, she, there's like this great battle and there's these super 80s special effects that actually hold up pretty well because many of them are practical effects and he turns into a demon. And that's just a great, anytime somebody turns into a demon and his practical effects, you have me. So you have all this schlocky humor and then you have that and it's, fantastic and there's lots of digs against conservative culture in this film the the town where she ends up going to after she um gives her film career the, or tv career the boot uh is called falwell uh after jerry falwell i know we, we've mentioned uh that piece of hot garbage uh before but uh it's great. And it's just a big F you to, uh, to conservative ideology and, and anti-feminism and all these things. And I love it. Uh, I'd recommend this movie to anyone who likes 80s movies or 90s movies. It really straddles the line. You absolutely have to watch it. If that trailer did anything for you at all, even the slightest, you need to watch this movie. It holds up. Um, it should be watched with Dumb and Dumber. It should be watched with every goofball comedy that's still worth watching. I knew I recognized it because Nathan, the only movie I've watched more than Rocky Horror Picture Show is Elvira because yes. it was on TV weekly. And every time Always. I just sit down and watch it, I can't, I can't even tell you how many times I watched it. And it has all the great cliches. Like uh, when she has to get tough near the end, she walks into a sporting goods store and walks out with like banana clips hanging <laughs> off and like shells and machine guns. It's just ridiculous. She has a bazooka at one point. Fantastic stuff. Um, <clears throat> and most of it is just a teen comedy up until then. Uh, we're going to get to the last movie of the day. I know this has been a long haul. Uh, this is the movie I, I hate. I hate this movie. This, this is the film that actually made it so I can no longer do jury duty because when they ask me if you can understand how a person could kill a person, I say yes because I saw Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life. Um, this film from 2011... I don't even, I'm just going to play this clip from the trailer uh, and then I will tell you why I hate this film. There are two ways through life. The way of nature and the way of grace. You have to choose which one you'll follow. So here's a question to, uh, to the panel. First off, have any of you seen this film? No. no? I'm getting no's. Okay. Uh, no? Can you tell me the plot of this film from that clip? No. No? Then you understand the plot of this film. There <laughs> is no plot to this steaming pile of wet drive through restaurant garbage. Because here's the thing. It has a stunning cast, an amazing cast, um, high production values, and it's got Terrence Malick's name on it. So people lose their mind. Uh, I was in my undergrad where this film came out and I remember going into poetry class uh, after, after seeing this movie. And I mentioned it because we were reading a poem and I'm like, this is willfully obtuse. Uh, like this is the most, like there's this is intentionally not making sense to make people feel kind of like, I don't know, to make them feel stupid or like to fake um, some sort of intelligent content. And I said, it's like the film Tree of Life. And this girl who I will not name names uh, because I forgot her name, who was across <laughs> the room said, I love that movie. It was beautiful. And I just, I just, 
I wanted to burn the building down because that, and I'm not going to do that. Don't pull this episode. Uh, but yes, I, it was that bad. This movie for the first maybe quarter or third of this film, Terrence Malick directs a sort of period piece family drama. It's like a slice of life where Brad Pitt is this very well acted sort of troubled dad. It takes place at, mostly in 1956 in Waco, Texas, who puts a lot of pressure on his oldest son. Um, and clearly he's got some, the, Brad Pitt's character has some problems. Um, he puts a lot of pressure on, but it's never like, it's very realistic. It's never an overly abusive or, or oppressive environment, but there's this tension there. Uh, his wife uh, is played by Jessica Chastain, very beautiful, very talented. Um, whenever you can't get Bryce Dallas Howard, Jessica Chastain should be your next pick. Um, it, it, so it's very, it's very, and it's actually quite good, although you don't really see anywhere that it's going. It's a very realistic portrayal and it is very beautifully shot. Then he starts, Terrence Malick starts to introduce magical realism with all the subtlety of um, a shotgun shell in the microwave. Like it is pure insanity. Uh, all of a sudden, Jessica Chastain's character is floating in the yard, floating and no one's saying anything. Then we go on a 20 minute journey through a cloudscape uh, where characters whisper things that mean absolutely nothing. Like, you'll know the dream when you get it. I know you will. You'll get there. You're in the, then, okay, you're in the clouds, okay? Then we get, I think, a scene of some, another slice of life. And then we pan out from Little Waco, Texas. We pan out, we keep panning. We're in the stratosphere. We keep panning. We're, we're all of a sudden, we are outside in space. And then we're panning all the way out to the Big Bang. And then we have the Big Bang in its 3D splendor. And we zoom in to planet Earth when there were dinosaurs. And there is a sick 3D animated dinosaur who's struggling to breathe and lying on the shore of some primordial beach. And we have another dinosaur walk up to it and slowly, as if testing if it could sustain its weight, steps on its head. Step, step. And then we pan out again, and then we go back to uh, 1956 Waco. And then the film jumps to Sean Penn, who is that little boy grown up working in an office building in, I assume, New York City. And uh, he stares off into space often, uh, gives zero anything to anyone. I don't know if, if Sean Penn uh, eventually develops dementia, which God forbid, I hope he doesn't. But if he does, this is the look he will have all day long stares out a window, and then eventually walks through a door and is on a beach with a bunch of other weird middle-class people in bad suits standing with doorways standing in the sand, and he walks through various doorways that lead nowhere because it's a fucking doorway on the beach. Uh, that is this movie, Tree of Life. This movie is two hours and 19 minutes. Two hours and 19 minutes of that, and it's, it's not even entertaining to watch. There's a dinosaur stepping on another dinosaur's head, and I'm telling you not to watch it because it is that. This movie I, sounds like a, jar, a bunch of jarred farts. He literally must have taken, like, this is what I assume happened. I assume Terrence Malick, like, uh, sits down when he works on a script, and he's like, oh, this doesn't really work here. And he cuts it out with an X Acto knife, like William S. Burroughs, and then he throws it in a fish jar, in a fish, you know, uh, tank. And then when that's full, he takes all of them out and he glues them into a piece of paper and said, this is my next project. Okay. It is, and it, it is this sort of, it's, it's sort of an Andy, if there's anything I will say for this film, the tree of life is an Andy Kaufman esque joke on viewers. It is an insane attempt to pretend through sheer pretentiousness that there is value in what it's showing you by making you think it's smarter than you. And it may be smarter than you. I don't know, uh, listeners, your your intelligence, but it is not better than you. It is by far worse than you. Uh, well, isn't that the tagline for the Kane Film Fest? That, all of that. <laughs> yes, it absolutely should have been. Um, this is so. Uh, he's hmm. passed away now. Uh, God rest his soul. But my wife's grandfather was a very um, interesting but tough uh, Sicilian guy named Guy. 
Uh, everyone knew him because he talked to everyone. Some people uh, ran into the wrong side of him on the wrong day, and it was very rough for them. Um, but we went to see this film with him. There were, I don't know, maybe eight of us in the theater, my wife, me, and then her, her grandfather and uh, her grandmother. And this happened 25 minutes, just that, that turning point when things started to get weird into that film. And he wasn't a small guy. Uh, what the hell's going on? Does anybody tell me what the hell's going on? In the theater. And no one told him to shush or shut up. One person in the front burst out laughing. And another person to our left said, I, I don't know. That's literally how this went the whole time. <laughs> and if it hadn't been for guys <laughs> constant questioning, uh, reminding me that I was not insane, and that what I was watching was some sort of cosmic joke, I would never have been able to make it through. But once you made it through about 40 minutes, even though, even though this film was two hours and 19 minutes long, you couldn't not watch it because there was no way in hell I was going to leave that film early and have somebody else tell me and potentially convince me that, well, of course you don't get it. You didn't see the whole thing. I stayed through the credits, motherfucker. That's a bad movie. That's a bad movie. Is this right. like an even shittier version of Cloud Atlas? Oh, way, way. I was just going to say, way. it sounds like someone tried to put Cloud Atlas and the Fountain together. Okay. And like, I have also a high trip tolerance. Balls. Yeah, I have a high tolerance for um, sort of dry, drudging science fiction, magical realism, because at least like the Fountain or Cloud Atlas, there's like, there are these visual elements that keep me sort of engaged, even though I know that what they're selling me is just gold plated trash. Like I know that it looks nice and it's going to taste like garbage, but the wrapper's pretty. So I will watch <laughs> this one as beautiful as the cinematography often is. It's sort of like one of those, um, one of those, uh, when I walked in the sand, there were two pairs of footprints. God was following me. One of those posters in like your great aunt's living room became a film on its own. Really? Like it just slowly transitioned into a film medium without anyone understanding or noticing. That's what it became. And I'm like, no, there is no substance beneath the shallow veneer. Uh, and, and I would love to interview Terrence Malick on this. Um, I don't, I mean, I'll be very cordial, Terrence. If you want to come on, I would love to discuss it with you. You're very accomplished in life. Um, I would love to have the success you've had, but I'll tell you something, this film, if he'd stuck with an actual prosaic approach, um, he didn't need anything else because we understood as viewers, the story of this father who's kind of struggling with this confined 1950s sense of manhood and imparting it to his children while seemingly conflicted about it. We get that. That's actually quite beautiful and troubling and, and something we could talk about. But when you try and make it a universal uh, world and just, you know, cosmos um, containing idea, no, it isn't. It isn't. I guarantee you, no fucking dinosaur had a problem explaining to his child that being a man sometimes meant doing things you didn't want to do or didn't agree with. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. Unless by stepping on someone's head while they're dying, that was an indication that life sucks it's tough. I'm going to go keep on living. I guess maybe that's what he was going for, but I don't think so. Um, and even if he was 20 minutes of cloud flying with weird ASMR whispering was not worth the journey. Okay. I can't wait to watch this film. Uh, it's on Hulu and I will be uh, getting a Hulu subscription next month when I cancel my Netflix. Everyone. It's also on HBO. If it. anybody wants to watch <laughs> tree of life um i will tell I you i love this. torturing myself i will tell you this it's such uh, a mess the meta score critic i mean the, the meta score the aggregate uh critic ratings is 85 out of 100 um and imdb scores it at a 6.8 uh both of those things are probably inflated by people being afraid to say that this is a bad bad movie um, there, there is there is an element to that right like if it's kind of artsy like sure. uh, i Oh, the art community is not going to like me if feel, I tell yeah. they don't like it. I feel so, like that's how I feel about the girl with the dragon tattoo. Okay. <laughs> like okay. The, the level of passion that Tad and Nate brought. 
like that's that's my movie for me. <laughs> oh, okay. um, story. I'll also Story. say this. I meant to say this. If you really, if you really want to be uh, able to converse with um, hipsters who are even more conceited and ridiculously pompous than myself about this movie, <laughs> then watch uh, the Blu-ray version that was released by Criterion in 2018 because it's three hours and nine minutes long. I knew it. I gotta now, get me. I gotta. I, that's three hours of torture. It's that's, that's it's more. literally. Uh, I mean, sadomasochists could just have this film. Their apartments could be empty, but for a DVD player and a copy of this film and a television. And they would never need a partner. There's no satisfaction greater than this could be gotten. It's terrible. And I also enjoyed reading all of uh, the users' reviews um, who, who lament the lack of this quality of cinema in other places and at other times. And to them, I say, you're terrible. You're terrible. You're terrible. I don't understand. Um, the frequently asked questions though are really great. Um, who is speaking in the opening dialogue? Why is Miss O'Brien seen floating beneath a tree at one point? Why the constant narration? Uh, is Tree of Life based on a book? Uh, no, not unless it's a <laughs> book that is printing paper. I don't understand. Um, what is going on at the end of the film? Uh, why is this being so heavily compared to Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey? That question I can answer because people are stupid. Because <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey is brilliant because it literally, first off, it's brilliant because it made people watch a pretty good sci-fi thriller movie that both started with the beginning of tool use and ended with a 15 minute beautiful journey through cosmic scenery to see a giant space baby. Now. <laughs> Is it out there? Absolutely. But the level to be insane that Terrence Malick went through with the Tree of Life is beyond the pale. Uh, Kubrick was like, I can make a movie, see? Now watch this and try and get something out of it because you trust me now because I showed you a movie. Terrence Malick didn't do that. He said, trust me, I'm Terrence fucking Malick. And that doesn't work. So we're gonna watch this as a double feature with like what, like Birth of a Nation or something? <laughs> <laughs> the, mm, yeah i i can't so clearly i could have had an I, you know what i'm sorry to put you through this uh listeners i hope you've enjoyed this special love hate episode of colton classic podcast um it's uh, replacing my therapy session and uh, uh listen next week for part two of why i hate tree of life i'm just kidding there won't be a part two but no, I, think, uh, I, think I urge that. you guys yeah. I urge you guys to think deeply about film, enjoy it for what it is. And if you don't like something, that's okay. It doesn't have to not exist, but think about why you don't like it. Because when you can tell people why you don't like it, it shows that you're smart, but it also shows that we have different opinions. Uh, with that said, don't vote for Donald Trump. Uh, this is Nate Wyckoff here on ColtonClassicPodcast.com. Go ahead yeah, fiery and fiery and political. Go ahead <laughs> and listen to all of our fantastic episodes. Thank you so much, Tad Mastroni, Jeff Tucker, Mandy Longley, Greg Johnson. To play us out, as always, we have the wonderful The Chud with their song All About Evil. I want to let everybody know again that you can reach us at Colton Classic Podcast at gmail.com. Visit us on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Colton Classic Podcast or Instagram at Colton Classic Podcast. And remember that you can donate at patreon.com slash cult and classic podcast. Get free stuff from us. It's not really free because you're donating money to us, but you can pretend it's free and you're just paying us to be awesome. Thanks so much. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening to Colton Classic Podcast. This podcast is important to me, but what's more important are the rights, privileges, and freedom from violence of everyone in this country and in this world. And that means supporting Black Lives Matter. If you'd like to make a donation, please go ahead and visit coltonclassicpodcast.com where we have a list of places you can donate and help out. And please stay safe.